everyone, and welcome to From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams, and I'm an information specialist in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Kentucky, and I'm here with my co-host, Billy Thomas. Hello, I'm Billy Thomas, an extension forester at the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, and I'm glad to be here with you all today. So first of all, we've got several different segments that we're going to do today, one being on pruning. So uh, Billy's going to bring that up and introduce our first guest. All right. So, you know, right now is a great time to get out and do some stuff, do some tree maintenance if you need. And uh, we've got Eric Gracie. He's a management forester here in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources Extension. And he's put together this great video on some of the pruning basics. And we're also going to have Eric come on after the, his video. So if you've got some questions, we'll have Eric here so you can um, address some questions to him. Just pop those into the chat pod. But without any really further ado, I'll go ahead and share Eric's pruning video now. Hi, I'm Eric Gracie. I'm a forester with the University of Kentucky Department of Forestry and Natural Resource team. Uh, today I want to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, basic pruning for homeowners. Uh, it's getting that time of year where people are thinking about cleaning up your yard, shaping up trees. Uh, so first topic I want to talk to you guys about is just the basic tools that you would need to, uh, to do some basic pruning around the house. Uh, the first is a hand pruner. Um, this is considered a bypass hand pruner because the blade actually bypass. This is what you want to look for. Almost all uh, the more modern uh, pruners are going to be this style of bypass pruners. You may have some old pruners in the garage that this blade down here is going to stay stationary and the top blade is going to come down. It actually crushes the branch instead of cuts it so it does not make a good pruning cut. Um, you want to make sure you get a good high quality pruner because these things last a lifetime and uh, a little bit of extra money spent on the front end will go a long ways. Um, also, you're looking at cutting branches up to about the, your pinky in diameter. Uh, that's what these are made for. If you have bigger cutting needs, you're going to want to go with a bypass lopper. These are made for cutting up to two inch branches. Uh, and once again, spend an extra little bit of money and get a good set of loppers that will go a long ways in making good pruning cuts. And lastly uh, is a handsaw. Um, this one folds in and out. Some are stationary. Uh, they are made for uh, two inches and up. Uh, you typically don't want to try to use a handsaw on something on a branch that's too heavy for you to be able to, to handle yourself. Uh, also, there's a lot of good power tool, battery operated power tools now, and uh, they're making some sawzalls where you can get uh, pruning blades on those uh, for those battery operated tools. And those would also, if you uh, would rather go the power method, that would also be a good viable option. Okay, so we went over the basic tools, and now we're going to show uh, where to make your pruning cuts. So we have a ginkgo here, and I've kind of evaluated this tree to some degree. And this branch right here is, is rubbing into these other branches. So I know that this could potentially cause a, a wound in that tree at some point in time just from the wind and the trees rubbing back and forth. So this would be a good candidate to, to prune. And what I'm going to look for is uh, what we call the branch collar. And it's uh, this raised wood that is uh, along the, the uh, main, the bit larger stem of where that branch comes out. So what I want to do is I want to cut just on the outside of that branch collar. The branch collar actually has wood cells in it that allow this pruning cut to heal. If I cut into that branch collar, then I remove those wood cells and it, it eliminates that tree's ability to heal this pruning cut. So I, I see the branch collar. I'm going to come in here and then on my bypass hand pruners, I want the blade side closest to the tree. That's That way I'll have more accuracy in making that cut. So I'm gonna come in here, I see the branch collar, snip. I've removed that and that uh, uh, eliminates that rubbing branch. Uh, you can also see if we had a larger tree, larger cuts, the bigger the limb, the easier that branch collar is to find. That's a real pronounced branch collar right there. Same principle, you're going to make sure that you're cutting just to the outside of that branch collar. Okay, so uh, 
Next little topic I want to talk about is pruning young trees. Typically you would not have to prune a young tree. Uh, this is a three-year-old poplar seedling. Uh, unless you, uh, some of the cases that you would have for pruning a young tree is if you have a broken branch or a dead branch, it would be wise to go ahead and remove that, uh, those uh, branches. But in this case, uh, if you look around this tree, and a lot of times you have to look from all angles, is that you'll notice that this is the central leader and then these two side branches are nearly the same height as this central leader. So at this point in time, these side uh, branches are competing for dominance with this central leader. So in this instance, I'm gonna remove this branch and this branch to ensure that this yellow poplar maintains its central leader and uh, continues to grow with proper form. So like we talked about before, I found the branch collar, snip, branch collar, snip. And as you can see, uh, it's, uh, it's got a good strong leader now. It looks a little out of balance, but as that tree grows, it will uh, it'll shape up and be real nice. Okay, so now we're gonna uh, use our loppers to make a lopper cut. The, the principles are gonna be exactly the same as the hand pruner. Um, on this branch right here, when it's in full leaf out, uh, the weight of the, the leaves are, are uh, lowering this to the point where I'm having to duck to mow around it and to walk underneath it. So I made a note to myself last fall that I wanted to remove this branch uh, for the coming season. So I'm gonna come back to, I'm gonna come back to this branch collar and I'm gonna make the cut. Uh, so some people might be asking, well, why don't you just cut it out here? The problem is, is there's no healing wood and when you cut a, a, a branch off in mid stem. So that's why you always want to come back to a junction to where you have the branch collars. So I'm going to find that collar, the blade side closest to where I'm cutting. All right, so the last uh, cut we're gonna talk about is with the handsaw. Um, and typically these branches start getting weight on them to one, that they're hard to control. And two, uh, they can, uh, if you're, they're, the cut's not done properly, they actually will, the bark will rip and it will rip through that branch collar, which we're trying to protect. So we actually make a three-step cut, it's three cuts. I'm gonna start with an undercut, and then I'm gonna cut here and then that's gonna break off, but instead of that bark ripping all the way through, it's gonna stop where I made that undercut. So those are the first two cuts. And then my last cut is gonna be back here at the, at the uh, branch collar. And one thing that's good about this cut is they don't always, uh, aren't perpendicular uh, to the ground. So sometimes on this one, it's, I'm gonna be cutting almost with the ground. It's at an angle cut. Uh, so we're gonna start that. Like I said, we're gonna start with the, with the undercut. I normally go about a quarter of a way through the branch. And we're gonna come here and we're gonna make the second cut. You cut all the way through. See how that was ripping? So if I don't have that undercut, that would rip all the way back through to the bark collar. So then finally, it's just your last cut, and uh, I'm gonna follow this angle. Okay, so uh, we made our last cut. That's why they call it the th three cut uh, method. Uh, so we made the final cut, uh, you know, I put the tape on there for demonstration, but, uh, you know, we're right here, uh, but we should have a good, uh, good, uh, chance for that, uh, wound to heal itself and, uh, and compartmentalize and be a nice pruning cut. Okay, so we talked a lot about that branch collar and just how important it is to make the proper cut just on the outside of the branch collar. Here's a past uh, pruning uh, cut that was made and it was made correctly at the branch collar and you can see the wound wood or that's, uh, that was uh, coming, that branch collar that is going to uh, uh, close off that uh, cut over time. All right, so uh, 
I wanted to show what a um, pruning cut looks after it's completely healed. On this walnut tree, uh, you'll see that uh, that donut is completely uh, covered. That pruning cut that was uh, from several years back. And the beauty of that is once that uh, wound is completely covered, that uh, tree's had the ability to com compartmentalize the, the injury. It's calloused over and it's gonna prevent further rot and potential insect or disease uh, entering the tree at that point. Okay, last uh, topic I wanna talk about is timing of pruning and how much to prune. So uh, light pruning can be done year round. Uh, if you're looking at doing substantial pruning on a tree, that should be done in the dormant season. Uh, as far as how much, you can prune up to 25% of the canopy in any given year. Uh, and any more than that, you risk starving the tree. It will not have the canopy to support it. Um, timing wise, uh, if, if it's a flowering tree, if it flowers before June 1st, you will want to prune it after June 1st. If it flowers after June 1st, then you'll want to prune it before June 1st. Those are the general rules for pruning. Um, if you'd like more information on anything that you saw here or uh, more specific questions, you can go to uh, ukforestry.org and there'll be links that will help uh, homeowners with their pruning needs. Hey, that was a great video, Eric. We really appreciate that. And, um, you know, we're fortunate enough to have Eric online with us um, today, Renee. And um, Eric, um, you're becoming yeah, a we are. star in videos. Yes, a budding star. On our <laughs> yeah, <team. laughs> I, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. So if anyone has a question for Eric about his video, you can easily just type it in the chat pod and we will uh, get those to him and he can actually see those from um, from listen and look at them and be able to answer any questions that you all might have. But uh, Eric, so you had some good tips there about flowering and non-flowering trees. So there's a difference, I guess, in the timing of pruning. Correct. Uh, so most of our uh, uh, trees in Kentucky are going to flower in the early spring. Uh, so you, um, you know, as that general rule, you would do those after June 1st. You can also go in after they finish flowering and, and do your pruning then. But the key is to just wait till, uh, till you, they've had their chance to flower. Yeah, and uh, the tree that we're going to be featuring up coming up next, the uh, flowering dogwood, it's in full bloom right now. So this would be one we'd probably want to wait a little bit on then. Right. Okay. I don't see any questions, so it must be that you answered everything they needed to know in that video. Good work. <laughs> All right. That's yeah. fine. Hey, stick around with us, though, Eric. Um, some folks may have some questions. You know, if they're like me, it may take you a little while to come up with the question. So they may have some after some other segments. And, you know, Renee, I know we've got some other video segments coming up um, in the show. And I just really want to say a big thanks to our whole um, Forestry Extension team. Um, we are learning as we go with this process. Um, we're all becoming videographers and um, and editors and um, learning how to Zoom. And um, we appreciate Charles patience with us. Um, but we're really just trying to stay connected with those that have an interest in forestry and wildlife here in Kentucky and really throughout the region. Um, just because we have to kind of stay at home and we can't do the programs that we normally do, we wanna use this platform to connect with you all on a weekly basis and really get information to you all and really build this community of uh, folks that really care about our woodlands and wildlife and um, all that they do for us. Our website if you go to www.fromthewoodstoday.com, you can actually click on a survey and get on our mailing list or our website, um, actually our, uh, just to get an email from us when we're going to have these shows, but they're going to be every Wednesday at 11 for the foreseeable future. Um, Eric, it looks like you do have a question in the chat pod, if you can. Yeah, so um, um, looking at the questions, if the the branches were lost because of storm or snow damage, and they've broken uh, mid, uh, they've not broken back at the, the trunk of the tree. I would go in there and prune those back to that, uh, like I mentioned in the video, the branch collars, and, and remove those stubs. Uh, so without seeing the tree, I, I'm making that's a possibility. The other is that um, trees will self prune themselves if they're not getting enough sunlight. So it says that the branches have been lost from the bottom. So it may just be a process of that tree uh, 
uh, doing its own self pruning because those bottom branches aren't getting enough sunlight. So it could be a natural process that's happening. It would uh, be good for probably uh, to have a, a forester or, uh, or someone to take a look at it if you got some more questions. You know, I was going to say, we have on the website from the woodstoday.com on that survey you mentioned, Renee, um, folks can also upload pictures, you know, yes, so they can. Picture and you, uh, that you see something in your woods, whether it's a question about pruning or something else um, that you see out there in, in nature that you'd like us to try to look at and address. Um, we encourage you to use that as a way to kind of communicate with us as well um, afterwards. So, um, you know, along your, um, or what you're saying, Eric, we're going to be posting all of other references that you kind of mentioned and talked about as well um, on our website there from the woods today.com so others can get it yeah and I say a couple more questions on the the why uh, why branched uh, three-year-old uh, country I would definitely re remove one of the uh, one of the splits uh, similar to how the video showed the poplar uh, because uh, at that age you're going to want to make sure you're getting that central uh, that apical dominance on that tree um, so uh, I would just you know, just uh, uh, with as it comes out, you can see which one may have some more foliage and looks appears to be stronger. I would I would select it as the one to keep and remove the other side. Um, on the dead uh, the yellow poplar with the dead branches, so it's a real common pra uh, practice to deadwood a tree. Uh, if it's a large tree, this is something that you're going to want to get a certified arborist in there to do. It's uh, it, it's dangerous. The worst thing you do is get on ladders and start trying to prune trees and all that stuff. A lot of folks will try to do. It looks like there's a question about how do we get a forester to look at this. Um, yeah. What I would say is if you're a woodland owner um, and you really need kind of a forestry kind of assistance, and this is out in a woods kind of type setting, um, then the Division of Forestry has service foresters that can come out and meet with you. Um, we also have some consulting foresters out there. But for most folks, it may be actually an arborist that they're looking for. Um, if you can, you can find a certified arborist, just really type in and find a certified arborist in a Google search. And um, it'll, it'll come up with the International Society of Arboricultural's website. And they've got a nice little application um, where you can do that. And you, we can get a link posted to that on fromthewoodstoday.com sure. as well. So you can find it there. Um, looks like a melon shared that link in the um, chat pod for everybody um, if you'd like to. And the, the answer to the question, those dead branches will eventually fall out of the tree themselves. But the, what happens is, is they typically don't break off and fall out where you want. So you end up with a dead stub of a branch and that's a vector for insect and disease and rot to enter that tree. So that's why it's better to go ahead and get that dead wood pruned out correctly. And, and then you see the question about evaluating tree businesses or tree service businesses. And, you know, I guess somebody's had some bad experiences with them. Um, any thoughts on that, Eric? Uh, yeah, well, that's where that, uh, that website that Ellen shared, that's, uh, that uh, if you're a certified arborist that's recognized by the International Society of Arboriculture, those folks typically are well-trained and run top-notch businesses. And, you know, you always ask for references, just doing your homework with any contractor. All right, so um, how can you connect with the forester? So you can, um, and we'll have a link on our website from thewoodstoday.com, but um, the Kentucky Division of Forestry, a, a search on in your internet browser there should um, show them really quickly. And just contact the office that serves your county and um, give them a call and tell them you'd like to uh, meet with the forester so that you can get some advice on taking care of the woods. It looks like Ellen's put in another document um, on another link. People may just be able to copy that link and post it from their uh, to their site, but uh, about how to find a good arborist. So it gives you some information about that. And again, we'll post all these links on our website from thewoodstoday.com so you can get these after the show. Um, we be posting these shows right after they record. All righty. Um, all right. Other questions or any other things for Eric right now, folks? Well, Eric, thank you again for the video. Really appreciate it. And if you can stick around with us, we might pop up a few more questions later as people kind of think about them. But um, we really appreciate your efforts. Yep, I'll hang on until the end. Great. Sounds good. All right. So, um, Renee, 
Looks we, like, yeah, time for uh, Tree of the Week. Um, yes, we're going to do that now. every year. Every, uh, yeah. every show, we're going to do a new Tree of the Week, and this time it's on Flowering Dogwood. No doubt. So we've got Laurie Thomas. Um, she is an extension forester in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources Extension, and she's filmed a, a video on the Tree of the Week. This is a beautiful tree um, that's flowering across Kentucky and throughout the range right now. And um, I'll go ahead and pull up Laurie's video now. Hi, I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, and I'm standing here in front of the Tree of the Week, the Flowering Dogwood. Now the dogwood is probably one of our best known and most cherished of our small trees. We find it's common in our woodlands and it may even be more common in our landscapes and our yards. Um, it's native to central and uh, eastern United States. And this smallish tree grows from about 15 to uh, 40 feet tall and right now it's easy to pick out and because of what many people think are the flowers um, which are uh, these the four white look like petals with little notches in them. Those aren't actually petals. Those are the bracts or modified leaves um, of this uh, tree. The, uh, in the center of these four bracts are a group of flowers, kind of a nondescript little group of flowers. And the white coloration that you see here is what we would find in nature. That's what's going to be in your woodland. The pinks that we see out in our landscapes, in our uh, yards, that's from a variety of one, it's one of the cultivars of uh, flowering dogwood because there are a lot of different cultivars for flowering dogwood. Now the leaves can also be a good way of identifying a flowering dogwood. These are just now emerging on, on this tree and um, they're kind of oblong, um, oval in shape and they're oppositely arranged um, on the twig. So they're right across from each other and they have very prominent venation. You'll notice on the midrib, there's that strong midrib down the center and then all of the veins that kind of curve up towards the top of the leaf, make it a good identifying feature. Now these leaves will become a very attractive reddish to purple color in the fall, so it's also a very attractive tree in the fall. And speaking of the fall, the fruit of the flowering dogwood is an important wildlife food. It's an attractive uh, red droop. They'll be in clusters of uh, usually three to five. It's shiny, nice bright red, um, and it's especially enjoyed by birds. There's over 30 different species of birds known to consume um, flowering dogwood berries. Now, another thing about the flowering dogwood is the wood. So the wood's important, and um, the wood is, it's a very hard, durable wood, and it's smooth, and it's able to take a lot of abrasion, a lot of abuse. And it's been used um, for, in our textile industry for years. It's used to make spools, um, shuttlecocks, and dowels um, in uh, the, the textile industry. And so it's got very fine wood. Now, flowering dogwood does best on well-drained soils. It can grow in the shade and it can grow in full sun, but it does best in partial shade. Um, so it's a great landscape tree and it's a great tree out in your woods as well. well. Did you know the scientific name of flowering dogwood is Cornus florida. Cornus comes from the Latin cornu, which means hard and refers to the wood of the tree. Remember, it's got the hard wood. And Florida comes from the Latin floss, which means flower. So it's a flowering dogwood. So I hope you all have the opportunity to get out in your neighborhood, maybe get to the park, get out in your woodland and enjoy flowering dogwood this spring. I think that's a tree that a lot of people are seeing if they're getting out into their neighborhoods and just driving out and getting, getting out of a the house for a little bit. Yeah, certainly a very common tree in our landscape, but also pretty common in the woods as well. So it's a beautiful tree. Um, you know, some of those cultivars are really um, amazing as well. Um, you know, we don't see those in nature very often, um, but uh, there are some that you can probably find at some um, nurseries and other places as well. Another thing we seem to be seeing uh, coming out, as you would say, are snakes. And so um, right now we have uh, Dr. Matt Springer to talk about our next video. Yeah, so hello everybody. I'm uh, Matt Springer. I'm the Assistant Extension Professor of Wildlife Management within the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. And um, based on the last couple of years that I've been around, we always get a lot of uh, emails, uh, sometimes very stressed out emails at this time of year. Uh, and that has a lot to do with uh, snakes that are coming out. Uh, and, you know, usually we're out and about, you know, enjoying the, the nice weather and we're running into them quite a bit. So one of the things that we wanted to work into this uh, program uh, and hopefully a, on a weekly basis is a basically a ID your snake um, segment where we're going to show a picture that's been submitted to us here at the, the department and our extension team and kind of walk you through how to use the tool that was created to help ID snakes that's available to everyone 
uh, in the public uh, through our website. So without uh, any more wait, Billy, if you want to roll. I want to start off, here's our Snake ID website and where to find it. That's kysnakes.ca.uky.edu. You can also get to it off of our Department of Forestry webpage. Uh, it's, it's linked there. It's, a, it's got a, a box you can click on and you can just uh, search in Google UKY snakes and this will pop up. So here is our for first snake ID. Uh, this is a submission and I want you to take a quick look at it uh, if you can tell what's going on here. And, and yes, that is the inside of someone's car where that snake is actually popping down uh, like the rear view mirror. So one of the quick things we can, we can tell right off the bat and what I want you to see if you can identify the snake as you're looking at it. A lot of you probably won't be able to, but real quick, how do we determine this is a threat or not? Well, first, one of the easiest ways to do that is because we don't have a real good look at the head shape is we do have a pretty good look at that eye. And that pupil is, is, tells us a lot. And that's because it's a round pupil and not like a snake-like uh, or cat-like slit. So all of our venomous snakes in Kentucky, because they're pit vipers, have a slit eye versus a round eye with, for our non-venomous. So right off the bat, we know that this snake is a non-venomous species. We don't have to be as concerned it's still a little disturbing. It may have caught you by surprise, but you know that this snake really can't hurt you. From there, if we want to know what species it is, there's a few characteristics that we can pull from here. Like I said, we can't get the, the, the shape of the head. Uh, won't tell us much. We don't know much about the body shape. It looks pretty slender. Uh, however, it's not super skinny. We do know it's not really fat, but we can clearly see a pattern and a color. So we can tell that there's a, a saddle-like pattern with uh, a light whitish gray to a dark black is the saddles. And from there, we can actually plug that into uh, the, the ID or snake section in, in the website, or if you uh, get out a uh, field manual, you can actually use that and determine that our answer here is a gray rat snake. So this snake is a very common species across the entire state. As you can see there in the map, it's everywhere in Kentucky. Uh, it's probably the most common species people will run into. And these guys eat a lot of rodents. They'll eat a lot of bird eggs. You'll see them around your house quite a bit because they're probably going after the chipmunks or mice in your garden uh, or potentially after that robin or dove nest that's on your porch. The key here is they're perfectly harmless. They're actually pretty good to have around for rodent control and you can just let them be and you'll be okay. If you want more info on snakes in general, you always want to ID what you're dealing with as best you can. If you don't want them around your house, reduce those shrubby areas. Keep your grass mowed short. Remember that there's lots of positive benefits for actually having them around. As long as you're not worried about the, you know, the non-venomous side of things, you're fine having them around. They're going to do you more good than harm. And if you need more info on snakes, there's that website again, kysnakes.ca.uky.edu. And uh, there's the launching page. You can see all the different offerings there from geographic regions to understanding all the snakes that we have in Kentucky. I want to acknowledge the folks that did come up with this, and that's Dr. Stephen Price, Andrew Dreyer, Renee Williams uh, in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. I think they put together a great tool. And if you have any questions, there's my info at the bottom there. My email is mattspringer at uky.edu, or you can contact us through the Forestry Extension webpage. Uh, and just Google us and you'll find us and, and all of our uh, folks and information are, are listed there. Have a good one. Dr. Springer, I hope that person wasn't driving when, when that snake came <laughs> down. <laughs> that, that would be a problem, I would guess, even for me. <laughs> so um, how many venomous snakes do we have in Kentucky? So we actually have uh, three very common venomous snakes, uh, ones that you would, depending on where you are in the state, could very well likely come across. That's the cottonmouth, the timber rattlesnake, and the copperhead. Now we also have a, a fourth species that is really um, potentially only found at land between the lakes, the pygmy rattlesnake, and um, they're you know they're so uh, rare that it'd be very unlikely for you to even come across them there. Uh, but more common than not, it's either the copperhead, or if you're in far western Kentucky in in a riparian area, stream zone, around a lake, wetland, it could be the cottonmouth. So those are the two big ones. Um, and if you're in eastern Kentucky, south central Kentucky, rattlesnake is definitely one that you could come across. Okay. Again, if anyone has any questions, they can type those in the chat pod and uh, Dr. Springer is here to answer um, any of your snake ID questions. Uh, again, you can go to our website at www.fromthewoodstoday.com and you can upload a snake picture if you'd like, if you happen to 
catch one um, or see one and you can get it on a picture, then you could bring it in. He could probably identify it for you. Um, so um, is there anything else you'd like to tell us about snakes that we might need to know right up front or how to be better help you identify it if we were to send you a picture? Well, um, I don't really like getting pictures of headless snakes. I guess that's <laughs> the first thing I'd like to say. Um, the best thing you could do is give me some kind of size reference, whether that be a baseball hat next to the snake. Obviously, that's, that's sometimes difficult. If it's a live snake, you don't want to get near it. But if you can take a picture of the snake and maybe come back a couple minutes later after the snake has left and put something down there, that helps. Um, but a clear picture of the head and the body so that I can see if there's any pattern is really the two big things that help a lot. And the size reference helps too, uh, but a lot of times it's not you know, critical. Uh, as long as I have a picture of the head um, and the body. Okay. You know, Matt, I was really uh, appreciative of your video. I know snakes get a bad rap a lot, but I was really glad to hear you say um, about all the good things that they do and how they are really kind of beneficial in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's, I mean, fear is sometimes hard to come over and keep them in a positive light, but uh, there's a lot of good that come from snakes, and we often overlook it, uh, especially on the rodent control side. Um, so it's, you know, it's one of those where if you can stand them, um, it's better to leave them alone. And, and if you can't, then try to limit the amount of, you know, potential interactions you have. Um, and it's best not to overreact because most likely the snake is probably more scared of you than you are of it, even in the extreme cases. There is a question from Vicki about do venomous snakes actually kill you? So, um, a lot goes into that answer, but the, the short answer is, yeah, they could, um, the species that we have here are not as uh, deadly as, say, some of the ones in Australia or Africa. Uh, however, you could have a poor reaction to the venom that they, they may put into you if you get bit. Um, if you have underlying conditions, that's a, you know, we hear about underlying conditions a lot now in the media, but that's something that does play a role. Um, and, you know, how your body reacts with the venom is somewhat unpredictable. But for the most part, um, in Kentucky, if you do get bit, you have a very good chance of surviving. Um, and, you know, I've had a professor in my undergrad that got bit that didn't even go to the hospital and was perfectly fine. Um, you know, he was bit by a copperhead. It's not a pleasant experience either way. <laughs> uh, I believe he described it as getting hit by a sledgehammer over and over on his hand. Um, but it's one that um, I would not, you know, worry about loss of life immediately for sure. All right. <laughs> That's the only question I see. Does anybody have any other questions for either um, Eric or Dr. Springer? Um, they can go ahead and type them in the chat pod. You know, if you missed last week's show, which um, if you did, we've got it recorded on fromthewoodstoday.com. You can check it out. But one of the things that we showed was a recipe on making red bud jelly. And um, Eric Gracie did a nice video on that. And I just wanted to share with you and our audience, Renee, the um, red bud jelly. Um, that we made at our house. So um, if you've not made yeah. jelly, I encourage you all to go do so uh, before all those blossoms are gone. So um, Eric has put together a nice little recipe on the website there, and he's got a little video that walks you through the steps, um, but that's available for folks that might have missed it last week and wanted to follow up with it. But I encourage you to get out and make your own red bed jelly while you can. Um, it, it's not that hard. Um, they just um, collecting the blossoms and just following his instructions and it'll go great. So um, make your own red bud jelly. And I had some this morning and Eric, I will tell you that it was quite tasty. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah, so Renee, a, another good show, I believe. And a big thanks to all of our um, presenters, um, you know, Eric and Matt and Laurie um, so much for all their work and the whole extension team for, you know, coming together during this time to try to connect um, with our audience out there. And a big thank to you for kind of um, steerheading this for sure. Yeah, definitely. We couldn't do it without our whole entire team. Yeah. All right, so please join us next week, um, Wednesday at 11 o'clock, and we'll be here live. Um, in the meantime, fill out our survey. Let us know if you've got any questions, any show topics you would like to see. We're going to try to bring you timely topics each week on forestry and wildlife-related stuff. So um, please tune in with us next week at fromthewoodstoday.com at 11 o'clock Eastern time. Take care. Bye-bye.